Now then, with a view to God's help, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4 again. That's the second passage we read, and page 1351. Philippians chapter 4, and reading at verse 4 again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And especially the opening words of verse 6, which tell us to be anxious for nothing. To be anxious for nothing. No, I don't need uh, to tell you or to tell anyone that anxiety is a theme that people find very interesting naturally because people are anxious naturally. It's hard to say many of the Lord's people are anxious too, although the Lord tells us more than once not to be anxious. It's hard to say quite often the Lord's people are overwhelmed with anxiety. And it's a problem generally, the lack of peace and the lack of joy that comes from it, as we'll see in a moment. And there are so many people who don't seem to know where peace can really be found and where joy can really be found. As we'll see in a moment, you can't have joy unless you've got peace. You can't have peace if you're anxious. So there's plenty of people looking for these things and they just sadly don't know where to find them. Sometimes tragically too, as I said, the Christian can for a moment forget where real peace and joy is found. So the Word of God brings us back to look for it in the right place and to find it. And interestingly enough, the main theme of the verses here is not so much anxiety itself, but rather joy. It's all about Christian joy. Now, of course, uh, lots of people have artificial in their ideas, in their minds about what Christian joy really consists of or what joy is anyway. And they, they associate joy. Lots of people associate joy. Maybe you do. You associate it with, a, with an extravagant outburst of emotion. So somebody is only joyful if they're laughing and if they're clapping or jumping up or down or something of that kind. That, to you perhaps, is joy. Interestingly enough, in verse 5 here, where it says, let your gentleness be known to all men, I think it's one of the instances where perhaps the new translation did not improve on the old. Uh, the word in the old was moderation, and I think moderation would be better. What's being conveyed here is a sense of uh, self-control. And that follows from verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, but let your self-control be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, true Christian joy, yes, it can have its outward expression. It can have its laughter. Of course it does. But really, it's a, it's, it's a deeper rooted thing than that. Your heart here could be full of joy, but there's no particular outward uh, overflowing of that but it's real and it's there. So you could be joyful without waving your hands and all these things. Christian joy is something very, very real and something that should bubble up in the heart. Something that should be there really all the time. What is it? How do we keep it? Why do we lose it? How important is it anyway? Well, let's look at some of these things. Uh, joy is the main theme of this letter. In fact, when we were in the school, we studied this letter when we're still worshiping in the school. Joy is mentioned 10 times in the letter, and here he mentions it twice. It's, he's almost as though he's building up to it. Verse 4, you can't miss its importance. He doesn't simply say rejoice in the Lord always. He says it again, rejoice. So it couldn't be stronger than that. Rejoice in the Lord always, and he says, I say it again, rejoice. Now, they're not a people 
who were lacking in rejoicing. If you read the letter, that's plain. They were joyful enough, but he wants them to stay that way, and he wants them to abound in their joyfulness. And just in connection with that, before we look at it and its relationship to peace and anxiety and so on, I want you to notice that it is an important thing. It's easy to minimize the importance of joy. You may say, for example, okay, I know it's a Christian grace, um, but it's not really all that important, is it? I mean, if, if I lack joy, I'm, I'm not going to miss out in heaven, or if I lack joy, well, there's going to be no major consequences flowing from that. But that's not, in fact, true. Joy is important. It's important for yourself, and it's important for others in your life, and even those you witness to. Let me put it this way. If you don't have joy, if you don't have it as you should, first of all, it simply hinders yourself from living out the Christian life in its fullness. There's a text in the Bible that says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, I don't know if you've ever stopped to think about what that text really means. What does he mean when he says that the joy of the Lord is your strength? Sounds unusual. But if you think about it, I think what becomes clear is this, that that's looking on joy as a motivator in your Christian life. Now, we all know that what motivates us is our emotional life. That's what emotions are there for. They are essentially motivators. And love and joy are the two principal motivators in your Christian life. They are, they are what actually make you get up and do something. The more full you are with a sense of love and a sense of joy, the more likely you are just to live out your Christian life. I think you'll know as well as I do that sometimes when all you've got is a sense of duty, it's not so easy to do it. Yes, of course you still should. We should always be motivated by duty. But the Lord has so made us that our most natural motivators are feelings, emotions, love, and joy. So if you have joy, real joy in the Lord, it will strengthen you. And that's what the text means, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. So without it, the Christian life is just going to be that much harder. The second reason for its importance is the effect on others. Um, to put it very simply, if you have joy, real joy in your heart, it commends your faith. Now, I'm not talking about the superficial joy that I mentioned earlier. There's a lot of that around. People feel that they just have to put on joy in a kind of false way. And the world looks on at people who are just leaping and shouting and things like that. And the world is actually really switched off with it. There may be an instant kind of attraction, but it's very often uh, extremely shallow. And it doesn't convey any real or meaningful sense of rejoicing in something. Um, but, but if you have a genuine joy that, that keeps you and carries you and seems to, to motivate you really, along with a Christian love, there's a Christian joy, then, then that actually communicates itself to other Christians and it commends your faith to the world. There are times when we mourn, friends, and times when it's right to mourn. But it's not good to have a constant spirit of mournfulness that dominates our lives. The only caveat or the only exception I would make in that connection is that there's a, an ongoing spirit of mourning for your own sin. That should be there all right. But the dominant spirit in your Christian life should be one of joy. And even if a time of mourning is necessary for, say, a bereavement or something of that kind, that should never take away your joy, and your joy should rise to the surface and should be the dominant characteristic. It should be the dominant feeling in your Christian life. Now, do we understand that? It should be the dominant feeling in our Christian life. Nothing should take away our joy. That's why Paul says that although he is sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, he says. Though I am sorrowful, and he's talking there about the particular trials that came into his life, he says, yet, he says, I am always rejoicing. So a lack of joy hinders yourself, and it hinders others too. So then, what can we say about it? What does the apostle say? What does the Holy Spirit say about it? That's what we need to know. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that joy here is intimately connected with peace. 
You'll notice that because in the passage that's speaking here about rejoicing in the Lord and the importance of it, he says in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. There's a clear connection being drawn here between joy and peace. And again, if you think about it, if you think about your emotional life and how you're constituted as a person, again, that shouldn't be a surprise. I'll just put it very simply to you that the flower of joy can only grow in the soil of peace. Uh, in other words, the order is peace first and then joy. True joy can only come where there is peace in the heart. No peace, no joy. If your heart is troubled for some reason, you will not have joy. On the other hand, if your heart is at peace, then joy, the flower, will grow in that soil. So if something takes away your peace, by definition, it's going to take away your joy. So really what you have to guard in a way is your peace. It's your peace. When that's robbed, your joy is gone. And what Paul is doing in these verses here from verses 6 onwards, well, verses 6 and 7, he's identifying the great enemy of your peace or of your joy, and that is anxiety. Anxiety. That's what takes away your peace and takes away your joy. So again, we have to step back and say, well, what is this anxiety? You know, there's lots of it about, isn't there? Now, people go to the doctor with anxiety. People can be diagnosed with anxiety. People have anxiety attacks and so on and so on. What actually is it? What is it in the Bible when it's translated here, be anxious for nothing? Well, for the, for the second time, I'm actually going to go back to the previous translation and say that the old word had something to to commend it. See, if you read this verse in the King James Version, it says, be careful for nothing. Now, in a way, you see, um, the word careful, of course, has changed its meaning. And if we read that at face value, be careful for nothing, it would actually be wrong because we need to be careful about certain things. It's good and right to be careful. But at the same time, there's a certain carefulness that it's wrong. that's wrong. It's when carefulness comes to be full of cares. So what's the difference? Um, what is the problem? What does it really mean to be anxious? Well, let's, let's stick with this word care for a minute. That's the root of the word careful, and it lies at the heart of anxiety. Care. We all care. We're supposed to care for certain things. We're supposed to take care of ourselves. We're supposed to take care of the things of God and so on. It's a good thing to care. Uh, when a, 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 an officer in the Church of England takes a certain post, he has the cure of souls and so on. It's the same idea. Care. To take responsibility or to look after something. To take responsibility and to look after something. Paul actually mentions it positively here in this very chapter in verse 10. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Now, the care he was talking about there was the, the concern the Philippian congregation just had for himself personally. Even though he wasn't permanently in their midst, they had a, a special bond with him. He had brought the gospel to them and they believed and they were bound to him and he was bound to them. And when they heard of his difficulties, they sent a gift. It was a monetary gift financial help. They sent it through a man called Epaphroditus, and Paul is kind of embarrassed about it. He says, I, I, I don't need it. Uh, I'm lacking nothing, even though I'm in a difficult situation. But he says, I'm extremely thankful for you for doing it, and that it's your care for me that has flourished again. So they were concerned for him, you see. They were thinking about him, and that's right. There's a sense in which you could say they were anxious, you see, but not anxious in the bad sense, but they were worried in that way. They cared about him. They took responsibility for him, and that is right. Now, and again, in, if you go back to chapter 2, 
He rebukes people who don't have care. In chapter 2, in verse 19, Paul says, I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded, now that a, seems a terrible thing to have to say, who will sincerely care for your state, for all seek their own, and not the things which are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character. Now, Paul is obviously losing confidence in a lot of people that he thought were really committed to the Lord. He's losing confidence in them. But he's not losing confidence in Timothy. And he knows that when he goes to Philippi, he won't be concerned about himself, about his own reputation, or about his own wealth, or anything like that. He will sincerely care for your state. So, Timothy cares. He is concerned about the people, and he will pray for the people, and he will labor amongst the people. He cares for them, and he cares for them because he loves them. So, care is a good thing. So, if I say normally of a person that that person is careful, I'm saying a good thing. I'm not saying a bad thing. It's good if you're careful. It's a good thing. The problem arises when being careful in a good way comes to, be, to being careful in a bad way, or in other words, to be full of cares. When does that happen? It happens when you begin to focus obsessively on certain things to the point where they begin to distract your mind and to distract you from your duty. And that actually gets to the heart of it because the word here in the Greek has the idea of division in it. Distraction. The idea of distraction is at the heart of uh, anxiety. I want you to notice that, that the, that the Greek word for anxiety has the idea of distraction right at its root. In other words, your mind and your heart are being taken away from what lies at hand because you're focusing obsessively on certain things, distracting your mind, distracting your heart. Our Lord uses the word when he's rebuking Martha. Now, you remember Martha was uh, in the house with Mary, they were entertaining a large number of people at the time, and the Lord himself was passing through. And uh, Mary had sat at the Lord's feet to hear his word, but Mary was still uh, fussing is probably the best word to use, because she, she was actually fussing about the arrangements of the house at the time, the food and so on. Now, Mary had taken her own part with that, but she had recognized the time was right to stop and to sit and to listen to the Lord. Now, Mary carried on. And you'll remember that she was becoming increasingly exasperated as she was carrying on. And then she, she just cut in and she spoke to the Lord in a spirit that was not right. She said, do you not care that my sister has left me alone to serve? And the Lord responds and says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But Mary has chosen the one thing needful which shall not be taken away from her. You are careful. The very word that we have here for anxious, and at its root is distracted by many things. Now that takes us to, to what lies at the heart of the issue, you see, because what Martha was looking after was lawful and right. It was good to take care about it, and I'm sure Mary had taken care about it too, but you see what she did? She went over the top. She went over the top. She took a thing that was legitimate and right and focused on it. And she was so focused about getting it right in the way that she thought it should be got right that she actually missed the main thing. She missed an important thing. She missed the opportunity to sit and to listen at the feet of the Lord, which was the duty that required her allegiance at that point and at that time. And if, if my focus on something is leaving me so fretted and so chaotic in my mind and my heart that I can't do the duty that God has put before me at the time to be done, then I have fallen into this error. You see, I have fallen into it. Because the right kind of care is a, a burden of responsibility which should focus you on your task. And it should keep you on your task and energize you for your task, so that you always do the right thing at the right time with your energy in the way in which you should. If you're not, then you are giving way to anxiety. 
And the problem with anxiety is not so much that it's, uh, well, I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether it's a sin or not. Let's just leave that out. The problem is that it opens the door to sins. It opens the door. By imbalancing your mind and imbalancing your heart, it starts to put you off in a wrong direction altogether. I want you to notice, by the way, that in these verses, Paul is distinguishing the mind and the heart. Sometimes he just uses one expression, like the heart is normally a catch-all term for the inside. But if he distinguishes the mind and the heart, he wants to do that. He wants to think about your intellectual, rational part, and he wants to think about your emotional part. And here he does that. You'll notice that he says that the peace of God, in verse 7, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Now, that, that tells us that anxiety affects our hearts and our minds, and you know that it does, doesn't it? When you get so caught up obsessively with certain things in such a way that your thoughts begin to fight and to choke each other, it affects everything. Your mind, your understanding becomes clouded, your reason becomes confused, and your judgment becomes impaired. It affects your heart. Your feelings become disorientated. Your imagination runs riot. You're not sure who you love or what you love or what you hate or what you desire and so on. You become anxious. You need medication. It starts to affect your body because that's the way we're made. We are made so intricately. Your body itself is affected. You become sick. You maybe have to go off work. You feel low. You can hardly get out of bed because anxiety has actually overmastered you, and it has incapacitated you. It's incapacitated you. The thoughts that you should be in charge of, now I'm not speaking lightly there, I know that there are some mental situations where thoughts seem to run away with you. I'm conscious of that. I can't deal with everything at one time, but by and large, you see, most of these situations are under our control. They're under our control, and it's a spiritual problem when they're not. We are sometimes just not taking the issue in hand. We have allowed anxiety to come in. When I'm saying that the mind and the heart get disorientated, there are simple things, simple ways in which you can see that. For example, when a couple are getting married, sometimes perhaps a month or two months before the marriage, very often just the woman who has very serious doubts as to whether she should go ahead with this at all. And very often it's just to do with anxiety just to do with worry and obsessive details about certain things. But the problem is more deep and spiritual than that, and it can be. Now, I want you to look at what the apostle says then. What does he say? Well, he says, be anxious for nothing, he says in verse 6. He uses very universal terms. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. So be anxious for nothing, but in everything, pray. So be anxious for nothing. That means be anxious about nothing. Don't be given over to anxiety at all. Now, the, the universality of that bothers us a bit. We may say, well, do you mean nothing? Do you mean I'm not supposed to be anxious at all? And the apostle says, yes, he says, I mean exactly that. You are not supposed to be anxious at all. The cure I'm giving you, he says, is a cure for everything. There is nothing that should leave you anxious. Or to put it another way, nothing should rob you of your peace. And remember where we started? That means that nothing should rob you of your joy. Your joy is a gift, friend. Your joy is a gift from God. It's a permanent blessing that's meant to reside in your heart. It's something that should characterize your Christian spirit. And nothing should rob you of that joy. The only thing that I would say was an exception to that rule is sin. Uh, sin, indeed, has the power to rob you of joy. Uh, and so it should, in a sense, because what is sin by definition but something that comes between you and the source of your joy? It, it's, it's something that you throw in there between yourself and God, so it's quite right that it should take away your joy. But in another way, it should not. And what I mean by that is this, that you should deal with that sin right away. Sin does rob you of joy, so repent of it, turn from it, come back to God, expressing your sorrow, your resolve to walk in a new direction, and that's it gone, you see. 
with God, that's it past. So you let it be past too. Don't, don't let that thing you did just finish your life and spoil your life because God doesn't mean it to do that. If, if you are a Christian, you see, and if you're, if you're wanting to be right with God, well, be that then and put it right and turn from it because that thing you did, it was right that it robbed you of joy at the time, but it's not right that it should rob you of joy forever. It's God's gift for you and it's the blessing that he wants you to have. So with that a, a caveat, let nothing, let nothing at all rob you of your joy. It's there to be preserved and it's there to be cherished. So what then's the key uh, to, to, to this joy? I mean, how can I keep it? Or to go back a bit, how can I keep the peace? Well, the answer lies here. I mean, the apostle gives us the answer in verse 6. Now, this is the kind of text you see that's quite common. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication. It's, it's the kind of text that some people have on their walls, maybe on these kind of plaques. And it's the kind of text maybe that you highlight with highlighter on the Bible, if you, if you do that kind of thing. It's, but it's not very well applied. In fact, I could say about prayer generally that if it was practiced as well as it's often spoken about, then we'd be well on our way to peace and joy. There's books, I mean, if you find in a Christian bookshop, if there's a section on prayer, it'll probably be ten shelves longer than all the rest. But the fact of the matter is that it's spoken of, but not done well. Maybe it's even understood quite well. I don't know. I have my doubts. But is it done? And the doing of it is the key. Prayer is the key. It's always the key. Here it's the key to your peace. And it's the key to your joy. Now if anything should make you run to pray, it's that. It's that. Because too often we lack peace. And we lack joy. And you want peace. And you want joy. Prayer then is the key. He puts it very interestingly. He says at the end of verse 5, the Lord is at hand. Let your moderation, your self-control, your discipline be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Now, I think the Lord is at hand there is actually connected with being anxious for nothing. What he's saying is that if you're troubled, God is at hand. God is at hand. One day is a fearful thought, and uh, James mentions it in his letter in a way that induces fear, that, that the Lord's coming is near and the Lord is at hand. But Paul doesn't mean it like this. What he means is God's right there, he says. He's close. The one who is the author of your joy and your peace is really close to you. He's at your hand. And here you are lacking peace and lacking joy, and God, he says, is at hand. How do you find him? Well, he says, you pray. Instead of your anxiety, be anxious for nothing, but, he says, as an alternative. Now, what he's giving us here is the antidote, isn't it? It's the solution. The solution to anxiety, instead of anxiety, in everything, he says, in every single situation that you find yourself, let, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God is near, get his help, get his peace, and get it by prayer. Now, in everything, he says, now I think that everything is as universal as the other thing was. In every situation, God's peace and joy is meant to prevail at all times. The psalmist said in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. Habakkuk says famously that, uh, he presents a picture of terrible desolation, trees bearing no fruit, the land yielding no increase, and so on, everything. Yet, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord, in the God of my salvation. We, too, are supposed to have that joy that prevails at all times. So we do it by praying, or as Paul says, let your requests be made known to God. 
Let your requests be made known to God. Praying. The word praying carries the idea of coming near in dependence and speaking. People use the expression sometimes speaking with God as a substitute for prayer. I don't like it used as a substitute for prayer because uh, speaking with God takes away the element of uh, dependence and reverence that the word prayer has associated with it. Uh, speaking with God almost carries the idea of me speaking to you or you speaking to me. But the word prayer has in the Greek an idea of coming under, being in subjection, being in dependence. But what you do is you let your requests be made known to God. And you do that in a supplicating way. Supp to supplicate means to ask. It means to ask in a, in a focused, specific way. Now that in itself may be something that you find difficult to do when you're, when you're anxious, you see. How do you come before God in a focused, specific way? Well, you can do it. You see, the thing about prayer is that well, very often it's just not honest enough, you see. It's not honest enough. We don't come before God and pretend. There's no point in that, because he knows the situation. He knows it. And, and the reason he wants you to speak about the situation is not to inform him. It's partly to do with yourself. It's, it's your understanding of your situation. He, he's calling you to sit down. And to think, to express your dependency, your trust, your need for himself, and to come to him as your heavenly father and to say, well, this is what my situation is. It may involve saying, I don't understand my situation very well. I don't understand why these things are bothering me so much. This opposition that I'm getting from this person, it's, it's leaving me anxious and distressed, and I, I can't get away from it. And this person's in front of my head all the time, and when I'm supposed to be doing this particular thing, all I can see is that person and their opposition. Or whatever. Well, tell God that then. Tell God that. Lay the situation before him. Do so as your Father who is in heaven. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. I know you've had the experience that I've had very often myself of taking your burden there and taking it right back with you. That's somehow not what's supposed to happen. We'll see that in a moment. But supplicate. Ask God what your need is. Tell him, Lord, I need protection from that person there. Or um, I need to be less distressed by certain things that are said. Or... I need to be less dependent on the amount of money that I have or less anxious about being able to repay what I'm supposed to repay or, or, or whatever it is. Tell him, make your requests known to God. He careth for you. That's what the text says. Sometimes in our foolishness, and it's because we know who we are and what we are, we're surprised that God cares for us. We almost think he, can't be, he shouldn't be bothered with us. And in a way, he shouldn't, but he is. He is. He cares for you, and he wants you to bring your request. What is it that's leaving you anxious? Even if you're not 100% sure, take the matter. Take the matter to God. You remember what Hezekiah did when the Assyrian army surrounded Jerusalem, and the people were looking to him, and he felt he didn't really have the answer as such. He took the threatening letter from the Assyrian army and we're told that he spread it out before the Lord and he prayed. And that in a way becomes a marvelous picture of what you do anyway. Take the whole bundle of things that is distressing you and spread it out before the Lord. Lay it out and tell him what it is that concerns you. So you come to him as your heavenly father. And remember that that's the one you're taking it to. You're not taking it to a force in heaven. You're not taking to a, an abstract power like electricity or something like that. You are taking it to a person, to your father, the God and father of your Lord Jesus Christ and the father of your soul who has adopted you into his family, giving you the spirit of love and regeneration and all these things. That's the one that you're taking it to. But you'll notice that you don't just come in prayer making your requests known you come with thanksgiving. Now, you can't just delete that word here and still expect the text to be true. Let me highlight that. 
You can't delete the expression with thanksgiving and expect it to be true. In other words, you can't just say, uh, by prayer, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. You would say, well, surely it would still be true. Well, obviously not, because the word thanksgiving must be here for a reason. If the thing is just logically true that if you pray God will help you, well, okay, but why does he put thanksgiving in? Why does not just say, tell God your situation? Well, I think thanksgiving, friends, is very, very important. In many ways, it's key. What are you thanking God for here? You're anxious, so you go to prayer and you're asking something. Now, someone may say, well, obviously what you're thanking God for is the help that he's going to give you. Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think it's rather a thankful acknowledgement for all God has done for you and is doing for you. Now, it may include what he's going to do for you, but that's where the primary emphasis lies. Thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Do you remember that's in the Catechism's confession, Catechism's definition of prayer? It's an offering up of our requests unto God with thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Psalm 103 tells us not to be forgetful of all his mercies. Don't forgetful be of all the gracious mercies he has bestowed upon thee. You are to rejoice, you see, because God has done and is doing so much for you in Christ. That takes me really to verse 4 here, which is the, the overarching verse anyway. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. In the Lord. That's where your rejoicing must be all the time. In other words, it's focused on who he is and what he has done for you. And the relationship into which he has come with you, which cannot be moved or shaken by anything that is in your life right now. If you're saying to me, well, all these sources of joy are things I don't have yet because I'm not a Christian, what have you got to say to me? I would say, not much. Because, well, I've got a lot to say to you because all this is yours if you become a Christian. Immediately. And really, I couldn't give you any better news than that. But the fact of the matter is that if you're not a Christian, I can't honestly tell you how to find peace anywhere. I can't. I can give you lots of self-help help books, but they come off the press thick and fast because they're not the answer. I could do a whole host of things like that. Uh, but peace and joy, honestly, friends, I haven't a clue where they're to be found. I haven't a clue. If you don't find them in God, then I haven't a clue where you can find them. They are only found in the Lord. And really, what I'm saying to you today, if you're, a Christ, if you're not a Christian, is if you're understanding all this, and maybe if God is stirring up your own heart and saying, I want this peace and I want with jo this joy, get it then, friends, because I'll tell you it's to be got, it's to be had. You're in a place right now where it is to be found. If you just call upon the name of the Lord, all this becomes yours. I mean, the whole bank account is suddenly open to you. You're given the checkbook or you're given the card and you can begin to draw. It's all yours in Christ Jesus. You haven't got peace and joy. I know you don't. I know because I've been there myself and I've looked for it myself. I know. I know exactly how you're trying to get it. I know the ways in which you're going to get it. You think you'll get it, but you're not getting it. You're not getting it. But here, we rejoice in the Lord. And that, in a way, takes me back to the, to the passage I read at the beginning, because Peter, you know, when he's talking about joy, and joy is the, one of the themes of his letter, too. Uh, he, he talks about the fact that they're grieved at this present time by various trials. First Peter chapter 1. And he says the trials have a purpose. He says that the, the genuineness of your faith is being, uh, is being proven, he says, in this particular fire. But he says in this trial, he says, you are still greatly rejoicing. Now, why? Well, because of the various things that he's mentioned in verses 3 to 5. 
First uh, Peter 1, I'll read this for you. You may not be able to look it up quickly. It's page 1390, if you can, page 1390. But what he says is this. At verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has, right, what has he done? He has begotten us again, so we have a new birth. To what? To a living hope, right? He's given us a, a living hope. That means a hope that's actually really focused on something genuine. He's done this through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 4, what are we looking for? Well, for something that we've definitely got, that's an inheritance, uh, heaven especially, that is incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. That reminds us that the inheritance is more than heaven. It's, it's all that's in Christ, the riches and the resources of God that are in Christ, and most of it is reserved in heaven. And right now in verse 5, we are being kept in this situation by the power of God, kept through faith for the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this he says, you greatly rejoice, though now you are grieved by various trials. What he's essentially saying to them is, these trials are real, and they bring real feelings into your heart, but don't let them rob you of what can't be changed. Keep your joy. Rejoice in it. Still rejoice in it. You see, you're rejoicing in the things that what? That can't be changed. The things that don't come and go. The things that don't rise and fall, the fluctuations of life, the process of life as we live it with the things it brings with people and situations and difficulties. What he's essentially saying is get up above all that, he says, get up above it. And how do you get up above it? You say to yourself, I wish I could get up above it, but I just can't stop. Well, you can by going in there to your own little sanctuary and by shutting the door and by opening the word of God. And even before you pray, can I say that? Before you pray, let God speak to yourself. Open a passage of the Bible. Why don't you open a psalm? And why don't you start with a psalm? Let God speak to you. Or even start with a marvelous passage like 1 Peter 1, where you think of what God has done for you. Read the magnificent chapter of Ephesians chapter 1, where it speaks of your election, your new birth, your justification, and the ultimate consequence, which is your glorification in heaven. Read that before you pray and before you ask God everything, just to remind yourself of who you are, who you've been made by God, to remind yourself of what's really true about you, unshakably true. I mean, you know this, if all that is true about you, um, does that not really change everything? I mean, if I, if I could guarantee you today that you are living forever happily with God, that you have a new birth, a new life, and that you're justified by faith, and that you're going to live eternally in a blessed state, would that not change your outlook on everything? Well, you say, yeah, I suppose it would. Right then, for a significant number of you, it's true. It's true. So why be anxious when that's true? Is there anything in life that threatens that? No. No. Not nakedness, not famine, not distress, not peril, not sword. Not anything in the height or in the depth. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, O Lord. Um, and thanksgiving is all about that. Thanksgiving is putting yourself into the position where you think about what God has done for you and what he's doing for you. And, and you bring that back to God. You see, God says, let me hear it. So as well as you receiving it, you say it. These are, I suppose, a teacher would recognize that as a kind of reinforcing type of tactic. Well, it is. It's to do with spiritual reinforcement. It's not all that. That's not all there is to it, but that's there. As well as you hearing it from me, he says, you give it back to me. You tell me. You say that these things matter, that you appreciate the things that I have put into your life. Look at the good things. Count your blessings. Your, soul, your life is so full of them. Count them. Lay them out before me and do that. And let all your requests 
And if need be your plaints, let your complaints, let them be in the context of all that I have done for you and I am doing for you and will do for you. Let it be in that context all the time. Delight thyself in God and he'll give thine heart's desire to thee. If we, if, if we focused as much on these things that matter most, if we focused as much on them as we do on the things that are distressing us, our lives would be completely transformed. You could walk with your head held high with a kind of calmness in the most unusual circumstances. And you know, that would make people think, what's he got? What's she got that is so different? Well, their hearts are delighting themselves in God. That's what's making them so different. If you do this quickly, the result is that God gives you peace. I'm not going to elaborate on this peace too much because our brother Craig Scott preached a sermon on it very recently when he was here. Let me just say a couple of things about it. If you come in prayer with thanksgiving, making your quests known, the peace of God, he says, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Just two or three things quickly. First, it's the peace of God. Now, that doesn't just mean the peace that God gives. It's the peace that he has himself, you see. The peace that he actually has himself. I don't know if you've ever wondered about what peace God has in his own heart. We call God the blessed one and the most blessed God because he has blessed himself. He has peace, happiness in his own heart. The peace of God is a quality in his own heart that is free from anxiety. Absolutely. There's no war. There's no strife. Um, you see, there are many thoughts in God's heart. He's aware of all the evil that there is in this world at any given time. It doesn't disturb his rest. You think about that. It doesn't disturb his rest. He is still blessed in himself. That's the kind of peace that he is giving us. It's a unique kind of peace. It's a peace that is so focused on his sovereignty, his beauty and his holiness and his control over me and all other things that I have rest in the midst of everything that's going on. It's not a marvelous thing. He has it. And that's what he gives you, the peace of God, the peace that he enjoys himself. It is also the peace of God in the sense, of course, that it is the peace that he has to share. Who would think that the peace that he has is a peace that he can share, but he does. And he shares it in Christ, and it's only found in Christ. That's because he can't make contact with God any other way. The meeting place between God and man is always Christ. And it's in Christ that you find this peace. And that's why Jesus said, my peace I give you. Not as the world gives you, give I unto you. My peace. Now, his peace is the peace of God, too. The peace that enables him to be at rest in all kinds of difficult circumstances. Because he is human, he has to pray himself into it sometimes. In Gethsemane, for example, his mind was in utter turmoil. His mind was in turmoil, and his mind was distracted but he prayed himself. Do you notice that he prayed himself into peace in Gethsemane? That's precisely what he did. He prayed himself into peace. If it is possible, he said, let this cup pass from me. But he, he strove and he brought it before God until he knew the peace. See, when Gethsemane is finished, he stands up and the attackers are coming to him and he just yields himself into their hands. And there's nothing but majesty from that point onwards because he has prayed himself into the peace of God. Not, not as the world gives. The world gives you a false peace and a temporary peace. I hardly need to elaborate. The, the peace it gives you is false because it's not real and it's temporary because it definitely doesn't last. And again, he calls this peace a peace that is, surpasses all understanding. The peace of God that passes all understanding. It surpasses all understanding. I think this means... Um, it means a couple of things. First of all, that we can't actually understand really how it works. It is so mysterious. He, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. He, he brings it into the heart. 
It's his gift. It's a, it's a grace, you see. It's a grace. And the Holy Spirit of God just pours it in. And it's connected with the prayer. That's why prayer is a means of grace. It's a means of help. It comes through prayer. Maybe you find its effect later on. But peace has been ministered to you. It reminds you that you can't work it up. For example, if somebody's anxious, there's no point saying calm down or, or stop thinking about that. Or, These things are rubbish. They're false cures. In fact, uh, by saying things like don't think about that, the mind just goes back to thinking about them. Prayer is the answer, and it's the only answer. Nothing else will do. The way it works surpasses human understanding, but it certainly does work. And um, the, the word for understanding here is the word mind. It, sur it surpasses all mind. Uh, the, the human mind can't think of how to do what the peace of God does for us. And last of all, he says that it guards your hearts and minds. This is a marvelous word. The word guard here is the Greek word garrison. Now, a garrison is a, a group of soldiers that are designated just to, to fortify a castle or something to keep it safe. Uh, and the reason he uses that word is, is, so, is so marvelous because he has spoken about the disorder that's in your mind and in your heart. So if you think of your mental faculties for a moment, think of the citizens in there like being reason and judgment and things of these kinds. They're able to function properly because there's a garrison around them. The garrison around your mind is the peace of God. And when that peace is there, your mind functions properly. You're able to reason a thing through. You're able to make correct judgments and so on. The same is true of your heart. The citizens of your heart, like love and hate or desire and longing and fear and hope and all, all these citizens are able to function and do their duty properly because they are garrisoned by the peace of God. And you're just able to work and you are able to function. You become self-controlled and your self-control is evident to all men. And, and you live your way through this world with peace and with joy. Isn't that the way we're meant to be? Yes, friends, that's the way it's meant to be. So you come to God, and he'll make you just that. Let us pray. Lord our God, to whom can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And there are many broken hearts in this world. There are many who are struggling to find peace and struggling to find joy. And we cannot but weep and feel, feel sympathy for them, knowing that they are always looking in the wrong place. O oh Lord, we pray that you would turn hearts today to look to the only place where they can find these things. He is our peace and he is also our joy. We pray to find Christ, the source of all life and happiness. In his name we ask it for his sake. Amen. Let's close with Psalm 116 on page 396. Page 396 in your psalm book. To the tune St. Columba. At verse um, 3. Of death the cords and sorrows did about me compass round. The pains of hell took hold on me. I grief and trouble found. Now, th these things are real. Uh, none of this is meant to deny the reality of these things when they come. But what does he do? What does he do? Upon the name of God the Lord then did I call and say. What does he say? Deliver thou my soul. That's, his, that's what he asks for. O Lord, I do thee humbly pray. The answer, well, he found it. God is merciful and righteous. Yea, gracious is our Lord. God saves the meek. I was brought low. He did me help afford. And the result, O oh, thou my soul, do thou return unto thy quiet rest. Notice that's his default condition. That's the Christian's default condition. If you're not a Christian, it's not your default. For largely low, the Lord to thee his bounty hath expressed. Notice how how thankful he is for the goodness of God. Anyway, three to seven, let's stand to sing these four stanzas to his praise.
before the benediction, uh, I'll look, God willing, with you tonight at what it means to seek the Lord. Several people have asked me, what does it really mean to seek the Lord? So I'd like to think about what that means in connection with conversion tonight. And the other thing that I wanted to say, and I omitted to say it at the beginning, was that the people in Malaysia and Singapore are actually sending their very warm uh, regards to the congregation here. And we say that they remember us in their prayers, which is a very humbling thing. But I wanted to pass that on, their greetings and their prayerful concern, which is a wonderful thing in the Lord. So let's receive God's benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.